All right, we are recording. So who wants to go first? I'll, I, I guess I'll go first. My name is Scott Davis. Uh, I'm hosting the roundtable, so any complaints can be forwarded to me. I'm with Nightcrawler. 2052. Uh, my name is uh, Nate Smeal. I'm also uh, with Nightcrawler. My name is Ryan Swanson. I'm with Team 6045 Saber Robotics, and uh, it's been a long two weeks, uh, I mean two days of build season. All right, who else wants to go? Let's keep it rolling and then we'll move on to our conversation. I'm Julia. I'm from Team 3291, the Golden Pirates. I'm David Westerberg from... Uh, oh. I'm David from two th Team 4009 up in Duluth, Denfeld Robotics. I'm Will from 2239, the Technocrats. I'm Ken from um, Team 2042, Nightcrawler. I'm Audie from Team 7028. I'm on Simakriti. I'm from uh, Centurion 2472. I'm Mason. I'm from 219 Ultraviolet. I'm Andy. I'm from 7028 Binary Battalion. I'm Ian. I'm from 3926 Emperors. Anyone else? All right. Um, feel free to throw your information in chat if you didn't get to pipe up there. Um, I have a couple of housekeeping things. It's great. To, I, I recognize some people are on the call that weren't on the call last week. If you um, did not get an invite through the mailing list, I will post in the chat here a link so that you can sign up for the mailing list to be invited to the next one. Um, whenever we decide to do the next one, we'll talk about it, that at the end of the call. Also, um, I'm on the State High School League, the Coaches Association, and so I want to give a plug out for becoming a member of the Coaches Association. Primarily, the most important thing, in my opinion, of uh, being part of the Coaches Association is if you're not an employee of the school, you get a lot, millions of dollars of liability insurance. So if you're traveling with kids outside of the school um, or doing demos or anything like that, and you're outside of the school, uh, the insurance is super valuable, nice. Um, the high school league also does awards, so we do all state awards, like the sports do awards as well. And you can only nominate kids for the all state awards if you have at least one member of your mentoring staff in the coaches association. So um, get that liability protection uh, for your volunteers. If, you if you're not doing that now, I highly recommend that. All right. Um, I do not have an agenda for this. I'm open floor here. Uh, for those of you who may have joined late, I am recording this so that we can play it again. Uh, first thoughts, what do you guys think of the game? Do you, you like it? Do you think it's too hard? Do you think it's boring? What do you think? I joined the year before uh, COVID, or roughly, like 2020. Um, and so I'm definitely more used to game pieces having a designated cover color. And, you know, this year they don't have Alliance colors. Mm. It's an observation, but it's different than what the, I'm used to. It's kind of a uh, supersized FTC game. Uh, I don't think that's a bad thing. It reminded me a little bit of Relic Recovery. Uh, in, in terms of, you know, extending out, it's a, I would call it an, an extendo game, which I don't know that we've had that dating back to like maybe 2011 would count, but uh, that even predates me. So I'm guessing most people on the call probably haven't seen that. 
should be a fun challenge. I think overall, I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, it also kind of something I was talking to my team about was how it felt like almost a very large FTC game. And that might just be because the FTC game this year uses cones. Um, and I accidentally watched way too much match strategy for 2011 because I got into the speculation thinking it would be an inner tube game. Um, it wasn't, but the 2011 match strategy kind of paid off, I guess. Check out 1503 from 2011 if you haven't already. They're one of the only teams that dedicated cycled from the human player station. Uh, and they're, they're cycled. Yeah, we're dedicated. Or we haven't finalized a design yet, but we're basing ours heavily off of 1503 in specific. Um, I like it. Good call. I think this game is going to be very boring to watch. Just watching other events or even from the stands where your team's not going to be playing. It's going to be kind of boring, in my opinion. I think it's going to be fun to play. I'm a little disappointed that there's not much team interaction. It's kind of going to be you know individual teams other than defense not interacting with the other alliance very much. But uh, kind of a neat game in it otherwise. One of the observations one of our students made at our meeting on Saturday was that your game strategy probably isn't going to change match to match because you are you don't have to fight for where to score and you're unlikely to run into too many game elements in the middle of the field and so you're going to be traversing back and forth so you know obviously you'll you'll need to have some strategy but had they made it so that it was shared scoring um that would have been a lot more interaction like you had said andrew or if you uh if it was more like tic-tac-toe with the first person to get the top row, you know, you lock in that top row and nobody else can score on it. It would have been a lot more interaction. And and to Mohammed's point, probably more interesting to watch. I think there might actually be more varying strategy match to match. Not like with, you know, I think there's games where we've seen more, but it's not going to be maybe less because I think we might see the interaction will be based on who you have as alliance partners as opposed to who your opponents are because you're going to want to come up with a strategy that complements your alliance partners. I like agree. Who. There's definitely going to be more alliance partner strategy versus like general interactions. I know our team was really excited to see more autonomous importance this year. Um, really gives us a chance to stretch stretch that aspect. Yeah, it's interesting that the uh, end game, you really don't need any extra manipulator. It's just your your drive base, more or less. Uh, and so that's going to allow, I think, all teams out there to participate. And I think it's at the highest level, it's going to come down to the points that if you can get all three robots, uh, you know, up there balanced. Yes, yeah, speaking of points, I think it's a little disappointing that there's a finite amount of points in Alliance and Score. What happens when the top two ro robots score all the points in the first 40 seconds of the match? What did what do they do for the rest of the game then? The score is not going to get capped out at 100. I believe it's 186 maximum. It won't happen until district championships, and it's probably only in a like a quarterfinal type of match where you've got a, a dominant one seed versus a you know inferior eight seed. It might not even happen then. Uh, it's it's going to be a lot more difficult than people think. Right, you have to go across the field to get the elements, so at least there's that additional time to have to do that. I want to go back to the comment, I can't remember who made it, um, that they said there was more, the autonomous was more important. Can you expand on that a little bit? Yeah, so um, what we were seeing especially is that um, at least our team is going for largely semi-autonomous, even during teleop, um, seeing as there's not really any defense that can be played both in the human player stations and... Um, in the place where you can score so you can kind of just line it up and uh let it go from there especially if it's going to be more consistent than a, a driver trying to set it on there as well as having the ability to climb and balance the charging station during autonomous it's a really interesting uh new bit i do like that the autonomous helps you get the in-game ranking points that's cool one of the things i was disappointed about with autonomous scoring is that it's only one extra point 
to score a game element in auto. You go from five points to six points. That's, in my opinion, scoring, like if you were to score a cone and then go score another cone and maybe even score three cones, that's really, really hard. And to only get two or three extra points to have done that in auto, that seems like that that wasn't balanced very well. Yeah, I agree. And I think that it seems like uh, right on the surface, it seems like they're trying to encourage teams to try and balance the scale during auto, but it only counts for one robot up there. Right. So it's not, I was disappointed to see that you couldn't put, you know, more than one during auto on top of the scale. Yeah, I agree. I think that that was, I think, I think there was, I think there could have been a little bit better influence on autonomous scoring because for the reasons that you just said, um, I was disappointed. I mean, what our our team puts a lot of time into auto, and I was a little disappointed that we'd only be ahead by one or two points at the end of auto by doing things that you you could just do in teleop. I think the reason that auto has, I guess, less point increase emphasis is I think that what we're really going to see, you know, the benefits of doing auto is going to be in, you know, getting those link bonuses, you know, much easier to score because if you can score two game pieces, you know, by the time teleop starts versus a team that isn't scoring any and is just going to balance, you're only one game piece away from getting that link. And with longer cycle times, with having to do the full field cycles, I think that, you know, being able to do that in auto is going to be more important, but it also doesn't make it so if you're a team that can't do all those autos, it's not going to, I guess, make or break the game. I, I do think that time is definitely an emphasis compared to points that have been available in the past, like with what Ian was saying with autonomous, but also the, the charging station is very time focused. And that's, I don't know where I was going with that, but it's very time focused. I, I think it might have been interesting just thinking this off the top of my head now that if if it was like a at the end of autonomous if the if, if a robot at least one robot was on the, the the charging station and it was balanced or not would have been like a flag that uh, then awarded you this this state and then you got your points at the end that way if you chose to send three robots to try to balance for more points um, they didn't those would be points in auto, but wouldn't affect your ranking point, but then you would have more chances for failure. So you would be at risk rewards. Like, oh, let's just send one so we can get a balance. So we get that set so we can, it's easier to achieve the end game. But if we send all three for more points, but we fail, we don't have, now it's harder in, in teleop. Has everybody kind of come to the same conclusion that the most important autonomous you can do is, you know, drop your game piece, whether you're scoring low, mid or high, and then you you go balance. That's the most important autonomous you can have, probably throughout champs. I mean, it's eventually everyone will have it, uh, but up until the point where it's really common that one of your alliance partners is highly likely to have it, it'll be the most important. Yeah, it'll it'll be. At what point do you determine that? Okay, you're okay. With, you know, who is going to go do it? And you're confident you're going to get it done instead of I'm going to go run my two game piece auto because it's like we got to we have to get this. Kind of a scenario. You, you have to make sure you have to have that auto. It has to happen. And then to Nate's point of how do you establish that confidence that whoever decides they're the one that's going to do it are really going to get it done? Yeah, and at least no. end up parked on it with it tilted. I mean, you at least get the was it eight or is it ten? Ten. Okay. Another thing that our team was noticing was that the uh, staged game pieces towards the middle of the field are far enough away that it's very difficult to like place two game pieces and then go balance. It's just like a little bit too much time. Um, thought that was kind of interesting. Yeah, it's going to be a really interesting dynamic to see, especially like in the upper tiers of competition. And I'm thinking more closer to like a week one finals. If, you know, a second pick robot is going to end up being tasked with going on the scale or one of the Alliance captains who may be able to do more in auto, but would more consistently get that because it almost seems to me like something that it's not points available, but it's almost like points available to lose where it's like, 
every team has to do that if they want to be competitively successful in a match. Because I think, you know, scoring one and then taxiing and then getting onto that switch is like a 20 point auto or something like that. In Duluth, um, I'm pretty sure it'll be the number one captain or like the number, the captains are going to be the one doing that autonomous mode. The number one pick or the, you know, early picks are going to be doing, uh, maybe the number one overall pick can do a two, two game object auto mode. I don't see that happening in Duluth, or at least I think it'll be very few robots that pull that off in, in week one. Uh, and then lower, probably five through eight, you're probably talking, they're going to do one game object and they're going to get out of the, they'll get the mobility. And then your third robot, if you get a third robot that can score low and get the mobility, that's a, probably a great third robot for a playoff alliance. I'm curious just, to know. Oh, go ahead, I was Scott. Just, I was just going to look in the rules here, but maybe someone knows off, off the top of the head. What is the tiebreaker? Is, I heard it was fouls, and then is it auto scoring? Is the tiebreaker? I think because, auto would score. Because that would, especially in, in those like a champs where everybody's going to score every every game element whoever scores the most in auto might be what decides that match. With the big caveat of that's a long ways away. We have other things that we have focused on right now. <laughs> I'm curious to know uh, what, what trade-offs have been stumping people the most uh, a lot of discussion that I've heard is uh, tipped over cones and whether or not to go for them. Uh, but what are, what are some other trade-offs that people have been struggling with? That I brought up the cone thing immediately. I was like, that needs to be thought about strongly. And the different methods of having those two different types of human player areas for drop-off is something to think about heavily. Yeah, I definitely think that's going to be interesting. There was a interesting robot in three days concept of picking up those tipped over cones um, that I saw. But the other thing our team has been definitely deciding between is if we end up going for the high goal, whether or not to have a one degree of freedom arm or a two degree of freedom arm, because both of those are technically viable, but doing it one degree of freedom while simpler to make would be harder to play with. If you go one degree of freedom, you're probably talking about a, a high single pivot arm. Are you able to do that and also intake from the ground? I know you can do it and intake from the human player. Geometrically, I don't know if you're able to do that and effectively intake from the ground. So we worked it out in CAD. Um, and so you would be able to intake from the ground on the opposite side of the robot from where it's positioned because it would have to be off center to work within the limits of the game but if you do that and then you pick a cone upright by the time it's circled back around now the cone's upside down so then you have that question of how do you deal with that um and so we have some prototype ideas for that but you know overall it becomes more complicated to intake from the ground um so then there's a question of do we want to work on you know cone writing and that kind of plays into the one degree versus two degrees yeah, no, we, we had the identical discussion. I can share my screen real quick, if that's all right, Scott. Um, and I can show kind of the approach that we're, or at least the path that we're heading down. Uh, yeah, let me know, you can see that? Yeah, we can see it. Okay, so I'm going to scroll down. This is, um, we, we threw it together in CAD really quick. It's kind of ugly. Basically, it's like 4607's 2018 intake. Uh, except passive instead of actuated uh, with pneumatics. But this is, I believe, 43 inches outside of the frame perimeter. Uh, it's 43 inches tall. Uh, and I can show you some dimensions here. 41 inches outside frame perimeter, 43 tall. Uh, but it's a 
basically a two jointed arm. So the idea here would be it'll fold down the end joint would be motorized. So you've got a uh, super high gear reduction with chain uh, and planetary gearboxes. And then this joint here, the longer arm, we're talking about controlling it via a lead screw. Uh, so we went with a two, a double jointed arm. Other concepts that we visited are uh, like a angled elevator or a, a 233 pink arm. Uh, while we're here, I can share one of the prototypes we've done. All right. So, I mean, we essentially we're at the point where that intake, we feel comfortable enough with it that, you know, we're going to do a higher fidelity prototype and see how far we can take it before, you know, we, we decide that, you know, the narrow intake range is no longer viable. Uh, but from what I'm seeing, and if we ignore tipped over cones on the ground, we should just be able to align via uh, either April tags or the vision tape in the human player zone with the the double feeder station, the one that's uh, got the, the shelf essentially. And we should be able to use that very effectively to human human player load. Um, and that's kind of the, the approach that we're currently taking. I will say that I was surprised that you were able to suck in that cube with your wheels so close together. That was a little I had zero confidence in that. And it it when it worked, I was like, oh my gosh, we've got something here. Uh the the next uh iteration, the wheels are instead of being tangent, they're gonna be an inch and a half apart, which should still allow us to hold the cone with uh you know good security. Um the other thing that I don't know if it was clear. That prototype, the design enabled the cone to tilt back 45 degrees so that you're able to approach the, the nodes uh, straight on, basically, rather than uh, like going up above and vertically positioning the cone. You're able to just drive straight into it with the cone angled back, um, and it should make it easier for the driver. Yeah, that's, a, that's an excellent point to bring up. You know, even though you're scoring right in front of you or offset, that it's not always super trivial to make. You you you're trying to let, you know shorten the cycle time because you have to make drive all the way across the field most likely. So I have a feeling that um, when we think one of the things that has come up is that you if you have a bumper cutout and you can get the game piece inside your frame, you can rob game pieces from your opponent's loading station as long as you know, of course they're not in there so if everybody's on the other side of the field trying to score and they've got something laying on the ground you could run in there and grab it as long as you don't have an intake that goes outside your bumpers and i have a feeling that i don't see why there would be any extra cubes in there because if you're the human player why would you drop an extra cube but i have a feeling there might be a whole pile of cones in that station that are tipped on their side that would make cycling a lot faster if you're able to run in there and snag some out of there without needing to um, have them pointed straight up. Even if you just went and got those and you just dumped them in the lowest scoring area, you didn't have to have them oriented. You just kind of pick and lift and just set back down. Um, might be It might be worthwhile to have a separate, separate type of mechanism to grab those game pieces if you can just sneak around the corner and get them back quick. Is anybody currently planning on doing a low only robot? Uh, my students and I talked about a concept where essentially you just, you have a drivetrain and you've got a single actuator with like a bucket that you, you slam the bucket down over top of either game object. And then you just scoot it along the floor. Um, you just, you know, there's no other actuation. You put it in a hybrid node on the ground, you actuate your bucket up and you drive away and do it again. A robot like that would have the capability to score up to 45 points and it would be able to contribute to 75% of the nodes you would need, assuming you get the cooperation 
no, or uh, assuming your opponent alliance scores their three for the cooperation, you just need three more game pieces scored between your two partners to consistently get that ranking point. Um, I think it's a really viable strategy. I, I think that strategy could be, you know, four or five of the captains in Duluth, you know, just going low the whole time. So is anybody looking at doing that? Um, I think that's our team's second concept of we haven't really put it like to we're discussing both that and the single pivot arm um concept right now. And things we talked about was that for that kind of robot in playoffs, it may be more effective to use that bucket to just shuttle the pieces to your zone to allow the robots that could score high to then just have to pick it up undefended and score it. But then we also talked about how if there was a robot whose goals to do that would be it'd want to be really fast so it'd probably want to have be light small and have swerve on it i agree with that and if that robot was a little robot so like 25 inches in at least one direction so that it could fit on the scale with two other robots 100 percent see that robot being picked for alliance partner for finals fast cycling robot that it can it's small enough to fit on the the charging station for sure i see that robot getting selected for alliance for finals i mean it could be an alliance captain yeah i don't i don't think that robot's selecting or being selected i think that robot is doing the selecting if it's well implemented <laughs> and the, well the real be. the real benefit of that robot is you can build it in a week and a half you can build it in no time at all and then you can get your drivers to the point where they're better than every other driver out there. Uh, one question I have is how do we see, what do we think the effective uh, defensive strategies may be in this game? Considering really there shouldn't be any defense when you're going to get your, at the substations, I think, and then also in the community. Um, is it just in the open field? And what is that? What do people think that looks like? I think it's like hit and run. I mean, you've got to like cross paths as you're scoring with the opponent as they're scoring. I think it's it's bump and run. Uh, you're you're slowing them down for a second each cycle as you're going. Um, I don't see it's it's difficult because you've got very narrow pathing uh, in terms of you've got a, a choke point at the scoring location and a choke point at the feeder station. So cycling with three robots, I think, is really difficult. Uh, logistically for an alliance. However, where do you place your third robot if you're, you know, if you're going two offense, one defense, they have to be in the middle of the field. How are you going to get them to effectively slow down the opponent without also slowing down you? Uh, it's a, something I haven't figured out yet, but it's a, a good question and something that, you know, it'll require more thought. I had someone suggest on my team of like hovering around the community of not necessarily um, like staying in front of the charging station if they were to attempt to go on it um, and potentially blocking their way to actually scoring. That way you're not in the way of um, grabbing game pieces for your own team, but you're still generally keeping an eye on the scoring of the opposite alliance. Yeah, I wonder if you parked in front of the one of the two kind of entry points into the community and so you maybe kind of wanted to force the other robots to go around the other way and then that could be a pinch even more of a pinch point if you have kind of instead of going over the the um the charging station yeah i mean there's nothing that says you can't go over the charging station to get in there to score <laughs> well yeah and that's why i mentioned specifically right. covering in front of the charging station and the entrances to the community I think we're going to see a lot of batteries laying on the floor like we did for Steamworks. That was a cycling game where you had to be very fast and there were a lot of very high speed collisions that resulted in batteries popping out of robots. I think the high speed collision, I think there's going to be a lot of high speed collisions in this game because it's so cycle heavy. Yeah, I think a lot of those were not two robots trying to play defense. They were just trying to get back at top speed to their own thing and didn't see each other. That is the one advantage. You certainly should be able to see each other in this game, unlike Steamworks.
how many cycles do you guys think uh like your your top eight captains what are those types of robots going to be doing in duluth week one i think we might see maybe for a captain of a i guess probably closer to semi-finalist alliance maybe doing their autonomous preload plus six cycles or maybe eight cycles because i think we saw six a lot in 2011 but then with the addition of swerve which i know while my team isn't going to probably go for swerve this year there is going to be a lot of teams doing source i don't know how that will impact that because that will increase the viability of you know getting around defense I feel like we're going to see some robots that are heavy cyclers and some robots that are good fast scorers. And maybe they have their two teammates deliver pieces to them and then they score them high. Um, I don't, I don't know that there's going to be a specific archetype that is team captain, the Alliance captain. I feel like there's a couple of different ways to do very well. Ian, what team are you from again? I think uh, I think you guys are knocking it out of the park with your strategic analysis. You're you're right in line with what I'm thinking, and hopefully you're right because that would that would mean that I'm right. Uh, we're team thirty nine twenty six, the Emperors, uh, Mount Star Academy. Awesome, yeah. No, I, I think you guys are. I don't know what went into your analysis, but I was also thinking uh, six to eight for those top captains at Duluth. Which kind of goes into the question, how, which ranking point do you guys think is going to be the additional bonus ranking point or is going to be achieved more often at our, you know, regionals here in Minnesota in the area? And then, uh, and how often do you think we'll see those? By far, it'll be the, the links. I don't think the climbing ranking point is going to be, I call it the climbing ranking point, the sustainability. I, I don't recall the terminology, but the ramp ranking point is going to be extremely rare. I think it's probably similar to the rocket ranking point in 2019, where if it happens one or two times at the event, uh, uh, maybe it's a little bit more common than that. Maybe it's like 10 times at the at an event in Duluth. But I do think the link ranking point is going to happen semi-frequently, maybe, maybe one every three or four matches. I think we're going to see the link ranking point happen maybe every other match because – all it really takes is one robot parking there in auto, followed by a double climb at the end of the game. And if most of the teams are, you know, d designing their drive base so that they can drive up on it, I could see a lot of teams, you know, prioritizing that where, you know, it's the last 30 seconds. And even, you know, lower teams that are maybe only going for like low goal or middle goal are saying we can get more points by doing this and just taking the time needed to get that extra ranking point. I'm kind of torn myself. I think the, you know, if, if the teams do a good job of recognizing we can fill in all of the hybrid zones for you know, three of them. And then if both alliances do that, now they just need four and they need to get one more additional link. Then that should, you know, seem feasible. If they don't focus on that, then, you know, I'm, I'm wondering if, if teams work well on their auto of getting that, you know, to be um, engaged or balanced in auto, then they've got a chance with the two robots to, to try to get that level at the end. If they then now say, hey, we're going to focus on getting that done and spending, you know, a minute trying to get that. I like to ask myself, what do I think 2052 would do? And uh, what do I think, how do I think Pete, Pete will coach the match? And what I think you guys are going to do is I think you're going to tell your Alliance partners to fill in all the hybrids. I think you guys are going to go mid or high for three to get a higher link. And you're going to communicate with the opposing alliance to say, hey, we're going to get our co-op link. You guys get yours. And I think you're going to be relatively consistent in getting that ranking point. I'd like to think that, too. <laughs> we're thinking like a six-cone auto. 
<laughs> that sounds about right. Actually, I I would be I will be super super happy if by the end of the season we have a three game piece auto. Um, but I don't know. I, I feel this is giving me kind of deja vu of power up, where if you can dump your first game piece right away within one to two seconds, then you have the possibility of actually getting two more game pieces because that year for power up, you had to drive all the way to the middle of the field, get your cube up high on the on the scale, turn around, find another cube, turn around, get it back up on the scale. So if you can do two cube auto for power up, I feel like you have a shot at getting a three game piece auto for this game. Especially if there you're are also sorry. There are also those four chosen pieces in the center, which is all which also comes into play between auto and otherwise. Right. And I think that because and I think the nice thing about those four pieces in the middle is you can pick whatever you want out there. So if you want to score cones, you can line up all cones. If you want to do cubes, you can line up all cubes out there. I was happy to see that they let you choose what you put out there on the line so you could put right in front of your robot what you wanted to go for after, for your second game piece or even third game piece. So everyone's cool. doing cubes, right? Like logically they're a lot easier to intake from the ground and why would for you auto? put a a cone out there that's likely to get tipped over and not be easy to intake. I was really thinking about doing cubes. Like my initial thought was, okay, we're going for cubes. But um, I think with the FTC season having cones, I think of a lot of people might actually go for cones versus cubes because of their difference in durability. Are you saying in auto Ryan, or if you had to choose one for the entire match, what would you choose? Well, I'm saying the preloads, the four that you get to choose, you preload all cubes there. Uh, and for those who haven't maybe, maybe played with it yet, the cube is just a ball. It's just a weird shaped ball. It acts like a ball when you intake it. We were Our initial thought was we would put cubes out there to go pick up a second game piece for auto. But there is an argument to be made that the cubes are already standing up. If you can drive into them and pick them up, you could um, build a an arm that places on the pipe that has a guide. So you can just rip right into that thing and it self-centers. So depending on what type of a mechanism you use for placing on the poles, you might actually be able to place the cones faster than you could place the cubes. So I don't know. Well, but our initial thought was too, is that it's kind of just a beach ball with corners where it's easier to pick up. It's going to be easier to spit out. But if you build a really awesome mechanism for scoring cones, I could easily see that as being a good option for second or third game piece in auto. Yeah, it might come down to we haven't done a lot of prototyping yet with those and picking them up. I, for whatever team picks them up easier is probably the one that you're going to put out there, you know, for your robot. The one thing that we did notice is they pick up really easy. They bounce really funny. Yeah, they're they're kind of like a football in that regard. They um, they go all over. I wonder, did anyone look at Chief Delphi? I made a GIF of us throwing the cube and the cone onto uh, the, the respective node. Um, the the cube is like a football. The cone is actually fairly forgiving in terms of getting onto the node. Does that mean you're planning to launch? You're going to build a, a launching scoring mechanism. Yeah, well, if you didn't see it, it was uh, we we were flipping the cones. So yeah, you just need one rotation, and it's it's easy. Yeah, that we're gonna launch them. I think that for auto, we may it depends on whether teams because the auto bonus is the same regardless of whether you do high, middle, or low. I think for a two game piece auto, I think the preload that you start in the robot might be a cone, and then picking up a cube. Because with there only being three cube spots and the auto lines, you know, most likely going to be just going forward and backward within that, you know, whether it's on the cable protector, the charging station, or the, you know, open area, I think that we're going to see that, you know, they're going to stay in their grid and not try and move to another grid over prioritizing what type of game piece. I had. 
not considered this until this very moment, but you can launch from the community. You could just pick up the cubes and just throw them to the back wall and they might do Plinko down the pipes and land in the bottom and be scored. And, or they might land in the shelf and stay there. I mean, why not? Right. If you only have, if you, you build an auto routine and you've got three seconds left, why not in your last three seconds, go pick up a cube and just launch it towards the wall. Especially if you're balanced. You might, I mean, oh we got through. You can get up on the balance and then launch it. Who knows? You might actually get it scored. Does anyone have any thoughts about their drive base? You know, I know a lot of people are doing Swerve, and Swerve is typically square. Is anyone thinking of doing a long skinny robot, regardless of its tank drive or Swerve, so that you can fit three robots on the charging station at the end? I think we're considering more of just the tiny robot in general, both lengthwise and widthwise, just to get through the midfield congestion, because I'm, our team, um, we're probably not going to have the ability to do sort of because we have modules, but because we haven't because we didn't do it in our off season um, because of um, getting busy because we did test this off season. Yep. Um, I think that we're going to stick with tank drive, which with a game very powerful for swerve, especially swerve defense. That means we're thinking already, you know, how are we going to get past that midfield defense where it's going to be congested and I think, you know, just the tiniest robot possible in all dimensions is probably going to be the way to go for that. That also almost has a downside of not being able to affect the balancing of the generator. I keep forgetting its name, um, but the generator thing where it's like, I want to say shield generator, um, but with the generator because if you have two bigger robots and then you're like this tiny little robot that has just like a small whatever manipulator on it that's going to be a lot harder to affect the weight and balance of it compared to the other robots so i have a fun idea for everybody who is intending to run swerve if you get up on the uh generator or i again ian i'm the same way i can't remember the stupid name if you get up on the balance beam thing uh, and you get to the middle, you get centered and you actually strafe off the edge and you let two of your swerve wheels, you know, fall off the edge and then underneath on your drivetrain, you've got some sort of a rubber pad or other, you know, something that you're intending to eventually land on. You can get, you know, a third of your drivetrain out of the way while still maintaining balance. Uh, and so you don't necessarily need to be narrow in order to fit three robots up there. If you've got two swerves, you could go off the left and right, and you could have a, your third robot, a tank robot, come up the middle with plenty of room to fit three in case you miss the auto. So with that, I mean, to me inherently, I, I think of if, if you have room for all three robots, just, let's just say they're all really tiny. I mean, to me, it would make sense that you all three would drive up together. Um, you wouldn't have two balanced and somehow the third robot has to unbalance it. So um, in this case, would you like have them all kind of like at least the two? How would you do that? I mean, how would you get the two swerves off the, the, each side? And then I'm just trying to think that through. So I, I don't think you ever go up with three unless you miss the auto. Because if, if you make the auto, you only need two. You only plan for two. But if you miss the auto... I think your two swerves have got to go first. They go up and they can do this simultaneously. They go up, they jump off the sides either way. Once that happens, it's up to your tank robot to, to know, you know, to do their thing. And if you miss it an auto, you probably have to leave early and you have to probably be sitting there at 35 or can you go early? I forget. You can go at any time. Okay, yeah, I think I, so, I, was, you can drive over. You can drive over the charging station, right? So you can be on there right. at any point in time. Okay, if the only um, changes in the last thirty. The other alliance can't touch you. That's what the it other was. alliance there was something. can't touch you on a no matter what. But 
if they touch on it in the last 30, then you get the free level climb um, for it, I believe. Okay, so if you miss it in auto, I think you're going at 40, uh, and your swerves are going up super early. Uh, you do your little sideways thing to make room for your tank driver or whoever your third robot is. Then your third robot just does their thing, and it's their job or responsibility to find the balance point. Do we think that winning alliances at like Duluth um, are going to have two swerves on them? 1732 will have a swerve and they're very likely to win Lake Superior. 3197, um, I believe will as well. So will 7103. Uh, we're going to be running swerve. I don't think we're in that conversation, but um, there are going to be a lot of good teams at Lake Superior running swerve. Nightcrawler, you're at Northern Lights, right? So yeah, very likely that Swerve will win Northern Lights. Uh, I think there are a lot of other teams as well that are running Swerve. I, I think 2502 with planning Swerve. I feel like I feel like at least a third of the teams in Minnesota are planning Swerve this year. Maybe that's a grand overestimation, but it seems like a lot of the people I'm talking to of we're going to do Swerve for the first time this year, and you know we had a decent number last year, as it was. For those doing swerve, are you going to yeet yourself over the the uh, the ramp each cycle, or are you going to try to avoid it and go around either side? You've got a five-foot gap on either end. Um, but like I said earlier, I think traffic and, and path planning is going to be critical if you don't feel comfortable going over. And for teams doing tank drive, a way that you can differentiate from a swerve robot Go with pneumatic wheels and make a plan that you're going to be the one to cycle over the the ramp because that'll make you incredibly valuable as a third robot or or even just as a partner as a second robot. But it, it differentiates you versus, you know, also not being able or willing to go over the ramp continuously. Yeah, I, I have to – we have yet to – we need to build that angled, you know, of the, the ramp because yeah, you'll tilt it down, but then as that weight comes over, I'm worried about being high centered as it starts to balance as you're driving up on it. And so we'll have to do some testing with our last year's robot to see if that's, you know, is it something you can do slower? You have to do a little bit of a speed kind of a thing. And then you have to worry about tipping if you're sending it over that thing. Is anybody an autonomous planning to uh, go over the charging station. Yes, I think it, I think one of our autonomous routines will be to drive completely over the, the charging station, so you get the three points for moving out of the community, and then drive back on top. Um, I'm anticipating that we'll score a game element, drive over top of the charging station, pick up a cube or a cone, drive back on top. And now, based on our conversation 15 minutes ago, shoot that baby and hope for the best. How are you planning on recalibrating your robot position once you've driven over the charging station? I know we anticipate it'll be kind of slippery and your odometry will almost certainly get messed up. April tags. Uh, yeah, even from that distance, answer. though, I'd be a little worried. I don't think that we would go over the, I don't think we would go over it and come back and try to score. Well, maybe it depends on how much time it turns out to be, but in terms of like driving far enough to be balanced, uh, I think we'll use the gyro and we'll verify that the robot is level and then we'll either drive uphill, whatever direction needs to be driven uphill to rebalance. Yeah. We used so far our... the programming. No, go, go ahead. Go ahead, Mason. Oh, I was saying uh, so far the programming of actually balancing on it has been fairly easy, especially the swerve drive. You just just drive which way the gyro tells you. Yeah. Yeah, we used our we used that gyro in this orientation last year for the very first time, I think maybe ever in Nightcrawler's history. We when we were swinging on the climber, we would only raise our arm when we were swinging in one direction. Um, that was the first time we'd ever used that axis on the gyro to determine if we were tipped. Um, and like you said, it really wasn't that hard. Um, just took a little bit of thought and then the code wasn't difficult. 
I think some teams might forgo odometry altogether um, in auto, at least. Um, you know, because our team used odometry last year, and I'm our programming lead, but I was thinking about because I think that with the two game piece autos, if you're only going for two game pieces, really it's just, you know, driving in a straight line back and forth, and that can be done with just encoder readings or going over the ramp is just, you know, going back until X encoder and then going forward until the gyro says it's a level. Yeah, it's odometry is far more important on the swerve drive too to know, uh, you know, a lot more about how you want to drive. Um, that's that's what our team is planning on doing. Um, I know, yeah, with the tank drive, you can probably just just drive for a distance. We will use so odometry. I... We do all of our pathing with odometry. So we'll, but I don't think when we're doing game piece scoring as our primary objective in auto. I don't think we'll drive over the charging station. I think we'll go around it, or we'll we'll just go on the sides, um, and we'll use odometry odometry for that. And I said April tags, but you know maybe I didn't think that all the way through because you won't be on the floor and you won't be level. Yeah. So you um, have to take into account when you're on that thing. <laughs> I haven't. And yeah, I didn't really think about that. I haven't tested um, really the uh 16 h5 i think it is the new april tags um extensively yet but i know for sure when you're moving the readings off that are going to be way worse than anything odometry can tell you yeah it's just to help bring your odometry back in to range if you're slipping or something but yeah. when you see the april tag if you don't know where your camera is you know in relation to the floor <laughs> you're going to be in trouble yeah What does everybody think about the varying levels of inflation we're going to see in cubes? Do you feel like it's going to be a problem or do you think that it'll be, it won't be really much of an issue? Has anybody I put think, their cube? Oh, go ahead. Sorry, Julia. Uh, just, I, I think that the fact that they had to list that they have a specific device to measure how playable a cube is and that any minor holes will be patched with uh, electrical tape I'm I'm really hesitant about the durability of the cubes, especially when compared to the, the cones. Has anybody placed their cubes outside, like inflated them inside and then like brought them to a colder, colder area? If you've ever had a, a balloon, you bring it into freezing weather, it uh, it shrinks noticeably. And I'm thinking back to I believe it was 2016. Uh, it was loadout, uh, so it was the playoffs at Duluth, and they opened up the overhead doors, and it the temperature dropped by like 20 degrees on the Lake Superior side field, and uh, I remember Team 359, their their cat, they had a pneumatic catapult that was so sensitive to the environment that it actually was causing them to miss shots. I, if we see something like that again, I'd be curious to know whether the the temperature difference would be enough to change how the uh, how, how inflated the cubes are. I believe I saw someplace in the rules that you could score a cube even if it was completely flat. Is that true? Yep. If it got popped? Yep, you can. So having a claw will be advantageous to those folks as opposed to wheeled intake, I suppose. But, but I let don't me know. say, don't, don't do a claw. Do a wheeled intake. Claws suck generally. Oh, yeah. I we sort of have a rule of you pick things up with wheels, but um, yeah, I, I think it'll be interesting how many cubes are not going to survive a competition. I, I'm, I'm kind of, I'm a little worried that, I mean, what were, what years, what year was it? Oh, it was, it was the seven inch yellow foam balls where by the end of the season first, it started to run out and they started asking teams to bring balls because they were, running out of balls or was it the or was it deep space with the orange balls i can't remember but it seemed like deep, it was a deep space was good 2020 was the bad one the seven inch foam balls where they they're lucky that covid happened they would have run out okay after like week three they were already out of their supply i think mm, okay yeah i'm worried i mean 
I, the, these it's just plastic so hopefully these are easy to get millions of them and there aren't an issue but i'm i'm a little concerned about i mean we see people jump over top of 10 inch dodgeballs like running over to these little cubes i i'm worried about how many are are going to get destroyed in a match it's alan gregory and spectrum 3847 i don't know if anyone's checked out their build blog uh, i recommend that you do i don't know if they've posted it yet but they're going to post a video of them driving into the cube at full speed. Uh, and they said it was fine. Uh, they like bumpers full speed into the cube. And they said it, it held up to that. I'm not worried about bumpers and like collisions and like smushing it. I'm worried about sharp robot mechanisms that are guaranteed to pierce it. It's, it's probably the least durable game piece for sure. Since 2020, maybe dating back to 2012. It's, it's concerning for me. Yeah, we ordered 20 of them for practice, just not knowing how they're going to last. We don't want to be stuck not having any. We ordered 10, and we had a little bit of an ulcer of how much money we were spending on them to get those 10. Yeah. On a similar crazy. note, does anybody know if the the cone, is that a common size, or is it kind of a custom deal? Like, could I go to my, my high school gym class and steal a very comparable one, or do I have to buy it? After the um, game was announced, one of our mentors ran out to his car and brought one in, and it was within a half an inch of the same size. It was an orange cone that I think he got at Menards or Home Depot or something. Awesome. How about the weight though, too? Because it it seemed lighter than I expected. Like I thought maybe uh you know something you get at Menards maybe would have more weight on the bottom, but I haven't checked any. Maybe if you shopped at Home Depot, I think the Menards ones will be pretty light. <laughs> That's true. Yep. <laughs> I give Nate so much crap about Menards versus Home Depot. Um, I think the pliability is the rain. most important on it, uh, how squeezable it is. On Eric, can you say that again? Eric, can you say that again? I please? think the pliability is the most important on that cone if you expect to squeeze it. Mm. So. They might be the same size, but they might not be grabbed the same way. Yeah, as well as the like rigidity of the base as well, you know, in terms of yeah. you're trying to figure out a way to to write the cone. Hey guys, in the chat, I just quoted a thing from the game manual. The cones are made by Flag House and they list the part number for it in the game manual. So um, you can order them from probably quite a few websites. A lot of gyms, especially at schools, order their cones from Flake House, so they're pretty common. Yeah, this is a question going back to um, claws versus, or when you're picking up items, not using claws. It's something I've heard about design. Um, I'm not sure, but like one of the prototypes I'm from one of the robot in three day teams that I saw used a claw that had like almost a rotating pivot on it let me see if i can find the link on youtube but like would you still recommend going against that because that was like almost a solution that automatically passively righted the cones that were upside down is there a reason not to do that or would there be something a way to emulate that using wheels uprighting cones is a red herring and every minnesota team should score them in the hybrid nodes Almost every Minnesota team should score them in the hybrid nodes. That's my initial thought. Don't put any of your time and effort into scoring uh, tipped over cones onto the mid or upper level. I, I don't think it will be worth it for you. Um, the, the clamping intake that they showed, sure, it worked. Uh, it was you know effective for uprighting cones. A wheeled intake is going to be better. Uh, I can tell you from the prototyping that we've done so far, it's – the, the philosophy for an intake should always be touch it, own it. Uh, with a wheeled intake, if your wheels touch it, it, you should possess the game object. With a clamp or any kind of a pincher, you have to finesse your way in and then actuate it. Uh, and, and there's more uh, ability for you to lose that game object or to have difficulty acquiring it. So I, I really strongly encourage you to at least prototype a wheeled intake before going with a pincher intake. Another way that you could accomplish both goals um, of being able to use a clamp that orients and doing a wheeled intake is you could have a separate mechanism that brings the game piece into your robot, and then your arm is separate from your intake. 
so that you can get the the benefit of touch it own it um but then you can have your your claw mechanism that self orients and which would actually make your arm lighter most likely um so you could extend it out farther and be less tippy but now you've got two mechanisms right so you've got the give and take of what what what's going to be better you have to you'll have to prototype them all to to try probably find what's going to be the best option but i saw that intake mechanism too with the i think it was like the no slip stuff that you put in tool chest shelves and stuff that plant from the cube and then it it just the heavy part went down it's a if you search robot in three days, it'll probably be in the top of your YouTube search list. It was, um, I think it's a very popular video. Our team's planning on building a full replica of the charging station, the tippy thing. It's pretty big. I would love to go in with somebody and we'll pay $400. They'll pay, you know, $400 and get a group of teams to buy it. I know the hinges alone are $300. I haven't looked on any mark for the full assembly. I don't know what they cost, but I imagine it's not cheap. Uh, and that's something that we would love to, you know, do within a hub if we can. Our big concern is where are we going to put it? But um, we have to build one anyway. Actually, we have to build two because we host a week zero. Um, it's more of a question of if once the parents get it built, is it someplace that we can actually, is it going to be too heavy to actually haul it around or is it going to have to be something that's put together in pieces every time you want to use it and there's no place to leave it out? So you talked with Mike and he thought like full build, like replica or a the team version? Well, it'd be the one out of wood, the plans that first distributes. Um, I'm confident he's planning on making this the full thing. I just don't know. It probably won't be polycarb. Um, so I don't, I don't know about that, but first doesn't put out plans for polycarb stuff. They put out plans for plywood stuff. So it'll be whatever first sticks out for the practice field elements made out of plywood and two by fours. Yeah, we can see about trying to at least skin it with some sort of plastic too. So, yeah, well, we have all that face shield plastic. We can glue that down so we get the same slippery <laughs> stuff. Hey, if anybody out there needs plastic and really thin, Nightcrawler has a ton of face shield plastic left over. Stop by, we'll set you up. We, we might be interested. We were planning on using the stuff that we got from MMR from you guys for simulating polycarb. Yeah, if you run out, uh, we probably still have a thousand feet or so. Um, I finally got that roll to the point where I could lift it by myself. So it's got down to about a hundred pounds. So there's still a lot left. Well, that's a good question. A segue into wheels are what's everybody thinking they're going to run for wheels. So, you know, a lot of teams love the blue nitro because it has high traction on the carpet. Is that going to be a good choice for this polycarb? charging station or we're going to do something else we're running with the max swerve uh so we don't really get a choice I, they've got their you know plastic wheel that is integrated into the module so we'll be hoping that that's effective um and yeah in, in terms of the blue nitro conversation that's a really good question uh because it does have a, a a known low coefficient of friction on polycarb And I think a lot of a lot of the sort of modules you can just buy other kind of belting and you know put one inch strips on and mount that. But they come right pre-made with blue nitrile from from the manufacturer, so I'll have to do some testing. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see with the field being so open how much having high traction wheels really matters if you can just scoot around the middle of the field because it's so open. We might have to wait until week one or week two to see if having a rubber tread is a better choice than having a like a blue nitro high traction tread. With a swerve drive, I don't think you're going to be needing high traction. 
Uh, you're you're going to be able to run away pretty easily, I think. You know, those kit apart wheels aren't very good, and that's what they used to show in the demo, and it didn't seem to have an issue. So who knows? Maybe it won't be that big of a deal. Well, it's been an hour. Do we have more things that we want to talk about, or should we call it a day and wrap it up and go watch the Packers and the Lions try to try to make it to the playoffs? Any other topics that we want to bring up here? I think we did a really good job covering a lot of different scenarios. Uh, anybody have any questions they were hoping to ask and didn't? We should do that now in, in case uh, there's anyone out there with questions. I just have kind of a one one thought discussion. If if a team's looking to do um, the the mid or the high, um, I don't know what what's their initial thoughts on you know mechanism. Is that a rotational arm, or is that a linear, you know, like an elevator style movement? I mean, what are teams kind of thinking in that regard? After looking at Ryan's video, throw it. We're uh, we're currently going to be uh, catting a, a double jointed arm. Uh, we tried to do it with a single joint. I I wasn't super comfortable with the geometry of it. Um, I think there are a lot of really good solutions, and I think at, at high levels of play, you're not going to find a lot of design convergence. You'll have teams with you know inclined elevators. You'll have teams with elevators and and extendo arms. You'll have teams with uh, double jointed arms. I don't think you'll see any teams at high levels of play throwing anything, but uh, I'd love to be proven wrong on that. But yeah, it, it, there are a lot of good solutions. What I do think will be common, I do think teams are going to try to force an elevator because they're familiar with it. They can buy it off the shelf. Um, but to me, this is more of an arm game than an elevator game. What's everybody else thinking? Anyone else? Nate, do you want to share your initial thoughts since you asked the question? Yeah, I mean, I'm kind of torn. Um, you know, sometimes it, it, the arm can seem a simpler build at times, you know, less moving parts, sometimes getting that elevator built, although things have come a long way since we last built an elevator in terms of kits availability, of getting everything nice and square and making sure you don't have binding. But then with that arm, you, you have those torque you have to deal with and, you know, trying to control that arm, uh, you know, can be difficult at times too. So, I mean, it's kind of a trade-off. I'm trying to also think how much positioning needs to be done with when you're in the scoring position, if when you're extended between the two, you know, feeling like if it, somehow if you could minimize that arm length somehow, I don't know how yet, make the advantageous. Um, even wondering about like frame cutouts for the sole sake of get, getting back that one foot four inches by getting around those like the base of the grid too to make arm shorter. So I, I haven't like feeling like I, there's a clear winner yet. I just still trying to wrap my head around what's going to be, you know, not going to upset the controls team after the build team makes it and they have to figure out how to make it work. Adding on to your note about frame cutouts, I, I think there's a ton of value in doing that because you can use it as a mechanical alignment mechanism. You, you just drive in, you've got some kind of a wedge that uh, you know those go into your robot and you can uh, ensure that you're centered on whatever node you're going for. I think there's a ton of value in that. I haven't gotten to explore a lot of design with it yet, but uh, it's, it's something that a lot of teams should look at. Anybody else have any thoughts or have any questions that they want to ask before we wrap this up? Yeah, sort of. I sort of bounced out for, for a little bit, so I don't know if you covered this, but did you, did, you, did you talk about the viability of stealing game pieces from the other opponents? We did talk a little bit about the idea that if you could get game elements inside your robot so you didn't have an intake that went outside, mm -hmm. that you could sneak around the corner and pick up anything that was on the ground. My, my speculation here is that they're 
maybe a pile of cones laying on their side in that area, but probably it's unlikely there'll be any extra cubes because I don't know why the human player would drop an extra cube. But if you need, if you try to pull a cube off the shelf or a cone off the shelf and you drop it, you probably can't pick it back up. And if you need the cones to be standing and they slide them in and they don't stand up. So there might be a whole pile of them over there laying on the ground you could snag but you'd have to do it inside your frame perimeter to, to, to be legal. Anyone else have any thoughts on that before we go? All right, so I'm gonna close out with a couple of things. Does anyone need anything? Is anyone in a situation where, hey, if there's a team out there that can help me with this, this is what I need help with in terms of parts, you know, supply chain stuff, or like I mentioned, we have all that extra face shield plastic um, someone could use that for the field or even for just chain guards, wire guards. Um, I'm happy to share that. Anyone have any needs? If anybody is in desperate need of Falcons and you can't get them and you're fully committed to the, uh, to the Falcon uh, ecosystem, we did find two more that we're likely not going to be using. Uh, we have six total. I've, I've promised four of them to a team, but if anyone's desperate for them, uh, reach out to me and we can talk because we're not going to be using them. All right. Uh, and then I'll wrap up with two more things here. One, back in the chat, there's my email there. You're happy to get a hold of me for anything there. And I posted earlier the link to sign up for the mailing list. So if you want to get an email for when we, whatever we do this next topic, um, please join that mailing list. I'm also going to say that uh, if you missed it in the beginning of the call, if you are a mentor, and especially if you're a volunteer mentor, and you're concerned that the school's insurance might not cover you, you can get uh, millions of dollars of liability insurance for $47.50 to the Minnesota Coaches Association. Um, you can sign up to be a, an official part of the official coaches association, and you get all this liability insurance. And there's also state awards that you can submit if you have a coach who's part of the association. Finally, what do we want to talk about next and when do we want to talk about it? Uh, the other topics that were suggested the last time we met were uh, wiring organization. Where is my list? Wiring organization, 3D printing. Anybody remember? Ryan, do you remember? Oh, here it is. Pneumatics and using the robot simulation simulator. Anybody? Have I do any think the, the most interesting topics to me wouldn't be anything in particular like that. It would likely be, you know, season or game specific type topics. Like how are people doing at a certain time in the build season? Uh, just general updates like that. Maybe you go in with, uh, you know, you, you touch on one of those side topics or, you know, informative or educational topics, and then you just get into general questions and updates from people. Definitely. I was thinking of potentially su suggesting like prototyping results and like what people have found um, from that. I'm, I'm happy to do another one of pretty much this and just exactly the same thing of how's everybody feeling? What do you learn? What do you need to know? Should we plan for that? Do you want to do this same time, same place next Sunday? Is this a good time for everybody? I feel like this is the least likely time that people will be meeting as a team. Great for me. Yeah, this is a good time. All right. I will plan to send out another email then Friday, Saturday next week. Um, just kind of tentatively put it on your calendar. Sunday, 7 p.m. We'll do another what do you want to talk about prototyping ways, strategy wise, whatever you learned, um, we'll just leave it open and we'll do it again. And then David, I'm still looking forward to this conversation about how to keep our wires nice and pretty. I'm, I'm, I'm expecting you to, to, to lead us in that conversation. Me? It was, you were the one that brought I, it up. I'm not the one that brought that up. I just oh, bolt stuff together. Sure? I oh, am I, not the electrical person. <laughs> I, I thought you were the one that put that on the list. No, 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 no. Oh, Eric requested it. Okay. Well, Eric, 
<laughs> at one of these times we gotta we gotta see how to re- make pretty wires because I have we have no Nightcrawler has no idea how to do that. You you what we found last year is you find the student that has ADHD on your team that has hyper focus, and you set him in front of your robot, and you tell him make our wires pretty, and he does it. <laughs> Isn't that just then, like all of us students, though? <laughs> and then tell me the next day you have to do something on the robot and tear it all apart. Has anybody been able to get your students to create a schematic? I think by the uh, end of our season, I think the kids had like a wiring how things were connected just for the uh, inspection and, and judges. They kind of had a basic drawing but not prior it was a drawing of what had occurred <laughs> well, that's an improvement at least i will say that we did do one thing last year that we had never done before in terms of wiring is we put all of our devices in the can in a very specific order and then we gave them the id can id that equaled what number they were in that order so that it made much easier for us to track down if something was missing, where that break was likely to be. Um, you know, Did you know choose the, the order so that uh, the least critical things would be the furthest out? Yes, drivetrain and encoder, drive encoders. Our swerve were the first 12 things, yeah. Yeah, we had this conversation last two, week too about cannivore. No, yeah, cannivore, cannivore. Is that the one that is the USB? Yeah. On, you know, do you put your drivetrain, which is your most important thing on a USB device and, and, you know, how comfortable you're feeling with that. That was a good discussion last week. If you missed that, you can uh, watch the replay video. Oh, I need to post that somewhere too. Um, I'll put that in the next week email. So if you didn't see the video link, um, I'll post where the videos are for the recording I did tonight and then for last week as well, or the 22nd, I guess it was December 22nd. All right, let's not make this go any further. Thank you very much everybody for joining. I enjoyed the conversation, I hope you did too. And hopefully I will see you all and more of your friends next week. Thanks, have a good night. Thanks Scott, bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.